Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the committee's 10th meeting in 2019. Could I ask you please all to make sure your mobile phones are on silent? We have received apologies from Gail Ross, uh, who is unable to attend this meeting, and I'd like to welcome Claudia Beamish, who is attending the meeting uh, to deal with the only item on the agenda uh, in public, which is agenda item one, which is the restricted roads 20 mile an hour speed limit bill. This is our fifth and final evidence session on the restricted roads 20 mile an hour speed limit bill. And we're going to take evidence from the member in charge of the bill, Mark Ruskell, uh, and from his uh, colleagues and officials. So I'd like to welcome uh, Mark Ruskell, the member in charge of the bill, Maliki Clark, the, uh, Mr. Russell's researcher, Andrew uh, Milne, the head of non-government bills unit, and Claudia Bennett, the office of the solicitor to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, before I ask you, Mark, to give an opening, a brief opening statement of about up to three minutes, could I just say we'll then go into questions. Though I know there are some of you that have given evidence before. You don't need to touch anything, and if you just catch my eye, Mark, and, and we'll, we'll get you to bring in the right people, hopefully. So, Mark, would you like to make a opening statement of up to three minutes. Thank you very much, convener. When I was at school, uh, a classmate of mine was struck down and killed while out playing on his bike. Uh, he wasn't killed outside the school gates. He was killed in the residential street where he lived, like four-fifths of child casualties on our roads. 20 mile an hour speed limits make a big contribution to the safety of everyone on those streets where we live, and especially children. They reduce speed, prevent deaths and injuries, encourage choices to walk and cycle, and public support for them continues to grow year on year. A small reduction in speed has a big effect in reducing casualties, especially when scaled up on a national basis. And as you've heard in evidence already, every one mile an hour reduction in speed means at least a 5% reduction in accidents. So we estimate that nearly 600 casualties will be prevented every single year based on average speed reduction of just a couple of miles an hour. Now, government policy in Scotland and Westminster recognises that 20 limits should be the norm on the streets where we live. And that's backed up by the WHO, the EU and the OECD. However, 20 streets are often isolated ex exceptions to a blanket 30 mile an hour rule that was set back in the 1930s. So I am asking this committee to consider the fundamental question. What should the default limit be on restricted roads? And if the answer to that question is 20 mile an hour, then this bill is the only way to deliver it in a way that is nationally consistent, timely and cost effective. Now in my previous role as a councillor, I saw huge frustration from communities who wanted 20 mile hour limits but were denied. They're often told that it wasn't the priority for the council or that it might get scheduled in several years time or that councillors were skeptical or that there wasn't a budget for repeater signs or that an area with an active community council had made a better case than theirs. When I was then elected as an MSP, I looked at the national picture and saw that it was very similar. While Clapmanninshire and Fife councils had managed to painfully roll out 20 in almost every single residential area by seeking exemption after exemption from a 30 limit, other councils had struggled or had scrapped 20 mile an hour rollout completely. So I do believe, convener, that after two and a half years of working on this bill proposal with academics, with councils, road safety organisations, police, Transport Scotland and many others, that it is time to end this illogical 30 mile an hour blanket speed limit while using the same mechanisms currently have for roads where they wish to retain 30 miles an hour. There is a clear opportunity here for Scotland to take the lead as we've already achieved on the smoking ban and make a lasting public health intervention that will make our streets safer for generations to come. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, we'll go straight into questions, and there's quite a lot of, the, of them. So, Richard Lyle, you're the first one. Richard. Good morning, Mark. There may be some of us who actually agree with the comments you've just made, but others don't. So, how do you respond to witnesses who have told the committee that a national 20 mile uh, per hour speed limit is too broad a brush, and that the current arrangements allowing local authorities to set 20 miles per hour speed limits or roads they consider appropriate should remain in place. Can I thank you, Mr. Lahr, for that, that question? Um, I think, as I said in my opening statement, the fact is that the current system is not working. It's not delivering protection for children and vulnerable road users across the whole of Scotland. 
we have a situation where children in the borders, for example, uh, do not have 20 mile an hour limits in their residential streets, whereas children in Edinburgh do. So the current system that we have uh, is cumbersome. Um, it is leading to inconsistency. I've already outlined some of the reasons why that is, and that's why approaching this from a perspective of creating a national default will ensure that we have that national consistency across Scotland. Of course, it's important to emphasise that councils will still have the ability to exempt arterial and through roads from a default 20 mile an hour where it makes sense to do that. So it enables councils under the existing mechanism to fine tune the, the layout of 20 and 30 mile an hour uh, within communities to reflect the local road conditions. Okay, um, thanks for that. So what evidence do you have to support claims that setting a 20 mile per hour speed limit on all restricted roads will lead to a culture change in driver attitudes to speeding in urban areas? Um, well, we've seen the, the example of uh, 20 mile an hour rollouts on an area-wide basis uh, across the country. Um, I think you've heard evidence from Edinburgh, you've heard evidence from other authorities, more rural, rural local authorities as well. And, you know, the, the Atkins uh, report um, showed that the current rollout of 20 mile an hour makes the delivery of that cultural change very difficult because we're looking at isolated 20 mile an hour zones outside of schools. It doesn't reinforce the national, what the national speed limit should be for restricted roads, which is 20 mile an hour. It's very piecemeal, it's confusing for drivers. So I think it's important that we move towards a, a national default to ensure uh, that there is that consistency. Um, we've, we've done quite a lot of work with, um, with academics on the advantages um, of, a, of a national default in terms of education, in, in terms of uh, reinforcing the messages nationally uh, around 20 miles an hour. And it's quite clear that um, through a campaign of uh, national education around the importance of 20 miles an hour, combined with work with communities as well to point out to drivers um, what the implications are if they speed in terms of the impact of an accident, but also what the implications would be if they're caught uh, alongside police enforcement, that we can get a very strong message around 20 mile an hour. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, this hasn't been done before. Uh, all the 20 mile an hour rollouts we've seen so far have been incredibly piecemeal outside of schools. Um, but what we do have is evidence from where 20 mile an hour has been rolled out on a wider area basis. It has been more effective in reducing speed and it's enabled uh, in particular local authorities like Bristol, to do more of that work in communities uh, to reinforce the importance of 20 mile an hour. And there's, there's a sign that, that that's had a, a good effect. And I think the, the figures from Bristol, for example, in terms of speed reduction and casualty reduction uh, are very strong. Um, so simply doing this, you know, 100 metres outside of a school gate um, just doesn't, doesn't make sense. We, we, we need, if it's, if it's an important speed limit for those restricted roads, uh, where people live, then it's an important speed limit on all those restricted roads where, where people live. Um, just sort of reminded actually by um, one of the comments that was made by um, Superintendent Carl when he came to, to, to give evidence to you in, in this committee. Um, he, he did say, to borrow a phrase from the Violence Reduction Unit, um, road violence is preventable, not inevitable. We need to make inappropriate speeding and exceeding speed limits as socially unacceptable as drink driving. So that, that's an important point. And I, I'd argue you can only really do that if you have a safe limit established on a national basis. The, the other point I would make, just briefly, Convener, is in relation to um, that wider cultural change as well. Because if this bill becomes law, of course, the highway code will be updated. Uh, new drivers that are, that are learning to drive on the streets of Edinburgh and around the country will be driving in 20 mile an hour limits. Um, there'll be that national consistency. Um, and the new drivers that are coming through, they'll be the drivers of tomorrow, will have been trained on 20 mile an hour roads. So that cultural change, we can put that in place over time, but the starting point is to start with a sensible speed limit. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. There's, there's various... Uh questions to follow on from that. Stuart, you've got one, and then Jamie uh, Green, you've got um, 
Yes. I, I just wanted to pick up on uh, the remark that the current system is not working. And I do so in the context of the helpful report that uh, you've provided uh, from the Transport Research and Institute, which uh, replicates uh, the Scottish Government's road uh, casualties uh, and, and gives 10 years of numbers. Uh, it's table one in uh, that uh, report on page five. And, and the thing that is very clear is looking at the headline figures, the fatals in 2007 were 255, and in 2017, 141, approaching half the figure. And overall, the figure has gone from 12,500 12 down to 7,000. And if I look down at the built-up roads, there is a similar pattern, a slightly erratic uh, uh, progress on fatals. So is it fair to say that rather than the current system not working, that what this can be, if it is anything, is augmenting the many other safety initiatives that we're seeing having the benefit here. And is that not the more proper way of looking at it? This is not the magic bullet that's going to take all these numbers down to zero. Is that fair comment? Well, I think the evidence shows that 20 man hour limits can make a significant contribution to tackling these issues. I mean, what, what I would point out in this report is that Yes, there are KSIs that are killed and seriously injured uh, statistics on our rural roads, uh, which are not covered by this bill, which are A and B roads, which are significant. And it's clear that that's where the police focuses a lot of their resource at the moment. Um, but I also point to, you know, table two, which shows that the, the numbers of seriously injured people uh, on our built-up roads are significantly higher than on non-built-up roads. So. There is an important point to make here about the kind of level of injuries that we see in our residential communities, outside of our homes, on our streets. Uh, and that raises questions about whether councils or indeed the police are prioritising those particular types of injuries. And of course, what that doesn't capture is also the near misses. Um, you know, there are people that are injured, um, but there are also people whose confidence is, is you know, severely dented because they've been in a near miss. Um, psychological impact of that, uh, which puts people off, of course, walking and cycling. So, you know, there, there is a, that we do need some more care and attention on the streets where we live, work and play. There are serious accidents that happen on those streets. Um, and, and there is a need to really, to really drive up, um, you know, the levels of walking and cycling there. Thank, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Good morning, Mr. Roscoe. And uh, can I thank you for bringing this bill forward? It's, uh, it's uh, been a fascinating subject for the committee. But I just want to revert back to the original question from Mr. Lyle, and that was what evidence do you have to support claims that a 20 mile per hour speed limit on restricted roads will lead to a culture change? It, I, in your response, my understanding of your response was very much that because it hasn't been done before, there, there is no evidence. The only evidence there is is very localised to where there have been small local uh, blanket changes in specific areas like Edinburgh or Bristol. But we also took evidence that in the areas that did do that, the actual reduction in speeds was uh, very uh, nominal. So a 30% cut in the speed limit equating to a, a very small reduction in one or two miles per hour of average speeds in those cities, to me, isn't evidence to support the original question. I just wondered, do you have any more concrete evidence that there will be genuine cultural shift in drivers' behaviour? Um, I mean, as I said in my opening statement, um, a speed reduction, an average speed reduction of a couple of miles an hour is significant. Um, I wouldn't discount the, the, the benefits that can come from that. And if you have a look at the financial and policy memorandum that accompanies the bill, even a speed reduction of one to two miles an hour can reduce 600 casualties in Scotland every single year. So, you know, the average life of a speed sign is 30 years. So you, you, know, you can do the maths in terms of the number of lives that save the number of severe uh, casualties that will be saved as a result of that. So, you know, the bill is predicated on a, on a modest reduction of average speed. And as I think, as you've heard in evidence, when we talk about average speed, we're also talking about the higher speed drivers reducing their speed uh, at a more significant level than those that are going at a lower speed. So the average statistic doesn't fully explain what's happening on our roads. But even if we accept 
the average speed reductions that we're seeing in rollouts in Edinburgh, in Portsmouth, in Calderdale and other areas, that's very significant. Now, if we build on an approach on the back of that, which drives further culture change through what I discussed with Mr. Lyle in terms of national education, enforcement, reinforcing that approach across Scotland, I believe we can get higher speed reductions. But the bill isn't predicated on that. It's based on what we know already. And what we know already is that this will lead to significant reduction in casualties, significant reduction in deaths in Scotland, and an improvement in walking and cycling. And I think as a cost-effective public health measure that can be applied across the whole of Scotland, this is it. This, this, this does it. Um, in terms of... Um, cultural change. I mean, I think we are seeing a, a cultural change in Scotland. Um, you know, we, we produced a poll uh, two years ago uh, done by Servation that showed around, if you discount the people who didn't have an opinion, around 66% of people support a default 20 mile an hour in their communities. We repeated that work uh, last week and showed that's gone up to 72%. And that reflects some of the evidence we've had in Edinburgh, which shows that post-implementation public support for 20 mile an hour goes up. You've heard that evidence from Ruth Jepson as well, that opposition in Edinburgh has gone down. So we're seeing a cultural shift here anyway, where drivers and communities are becoming more aware of 20, they recognize the benefits, they're waking up to, the, to, to that. Um, and I think that's a good basis to build on, to drive the benefits further than actually what we've, we've predicated the bill on, which is modest. Can we go further? Yes, I think the evidence suggests that we can. Can I pinpoint exactly what that speed reduction is going to be in 10 years' time? No. My, the premise of my question is, you say modest, uh, the bill's approach is modest, but wh why do we have to cut the speed limit by a third to achieve a one mile per hour reduction in average speeds? Is, I mean, is that really the only way you think that we can achieve that? Are there not better or other ways that we could uh, reduce average speeds rather than such a, uh, quite a, a, a huge reduction in, in the statutory speed limit? Well, I believe the evidence shows this is the most cost-effective way to achieve that. Um, it, it, other ways to reduce speed, putting speed humps on every single road, every single restricted road, incredibly costly. Um, the speed limit uh, is traffic law. We have a well-established framework for traffic law. Uh, we have restricted roads at 30 miles an hour. A low-cost intervention is to reduce that speed limit to 20 miles an hour. Um, to carry out interventions on every single road, to physically design every single road uh, to be at a lower speed limit uh, would, would be a vast amount of public expense. And it's actually not what we do at the moment. Um, you know, 30 mile an hour roads uh, around Edinburgh, are those designed to be 30 mile an hour? No, they're not. You can, if you wanted to, you could drive at Holyrood Road at 40 or 50 miles an hour if you wanted to. There's an element of self-enforcing with these speed limits. Um, and and that, that's what we currently have with the designation of speed limits in this country. What I'm, what I'm proposing is to not rip up the system, but to go with the grain of the system and to reduce speed from 30 to 20. And that that will result in, in, a, in a modest but substantial reduction uh, of speed and casualties. And move on to the next question. We've got three follow-up questions here. So um, it would be Mike, Maureen and then Claudia. Yeah, I'd just like to follow up on... Your response to Richard's question about you, you seem to be somewhat critical of our local authorities who haven't gone the way Edinburgh have gone, for instance. But surely our local authorities know and they've examined where they want 20 mile an hour streets. Surely they have examined their own local areas and decided either to go forward or not to go forward with them. Are they not best placed to do that? Because you seem to be, rather than taking a national approach, you seem to be critical of local decision making here. Well, not at all. I mean, I've, I've engaged with many local authorities throughout this process and Scots, who, of course, represent the heads of transportation for all the local authorities. I mean, as a former councillor myself, I recognise the challenges that councils face. Um, but, you know, you also have to bear in mind that the majority of local authorities that have responded to multiple consultations on this bill have supported this as a measure, have supported this as being the most cost-effective way to deliver 20 miles an hour across their areas. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do believe that this is a, a measure which local authorities will, will, will are supporting and will continue to support as a way to deliver 20. In terms of local discretion, um, 
yes, councils need that local discretion about how they implement 20 and what they retain as 30 miles an hour. Um, I think there's been interesting discussion in committee, including from yourself, Mr. Rumbles, about Afford and about these rural communities. Um, I understand where you're coming from. I live in a rural community myself. And I think if you look at the rollout that Fife Council has done, for example, in some areas they've decided to create a wider network of 20 that includes the through roads uh, through certain villages and other villages have decided not to do that because of the volume of traffic going through the area. So in terms of the exact precise rollout uh, and retention of 30 and 20 within each individual village or area, that is, that is rightfully something which local authorities need to make their own decision on. Um, but that's within a context of a, of a national default uh, of 20 miles an hour. The current context for that, of course, is a national default for 30 miles an hour. So local authorities are already working with a national speed limit. They're seeking to make adjustments within that to reflect the conditions and requirements of each local authority. This makes it easier for them. And the situation that we've had in Fife, where the council has put in exemption after exemption after exemption from a national default, uh, is, is, is unfortunately um, the, the only tool that the, the council's had to, to bring in effectively a, a, a default in five for 20 miles an hour. But it's been very uh, costly and time consuming. And I think that's why a substantial number of local authorities are now saying, before we do anything more on 20 mile an hour, we're waiting for this bill to be enacted because it just makes it easier, simpler, more cost effective while retaining our ability uh, to make those local decisions about where we retain 30, what kind of signs we put up um, in consultation with communities. Um, Maureen, yours is the next Thank question. Thank you, convener. Morning, panel. <coughs> um, Mark, you said that the highway code would need to be updated. The highway code is UK wide. Um, so can you tell me, you know, how it would be updated, what would happen and, and what currently happens to the places in England that you've already said have introduced this? Uh, in, well, I mean, the highway code is, is, is the highway code and, you know, whether there would need to be a, a kind of supplementary page for Scotland, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But, I mean, the, the point that I was making is that all of the... Um, training documents and programs um, that are put in place and the work that driving instructors do and organizations like Institute of Advanced Motorists, um, that, that's predicated on a, on a 30 mile an hour um, speed limit uh, on our restricted roads. Um, I, I did my driving test uh, in Edinburgh uh, probably 30 years ago now. I, I did fail it twice. Um, but, you know, that was on a 30 mile an hour road. Um, it'd be a very different experience now doing it on a 20 mile an hour road. So I'm, I, I don't think it's a, an insurmountable challenge to see an amendment uh, to these training documents to reflect what we would have in Scotland, which would be a, a default 20, a safer speed limit in our, in our roads. Um, I've just been informed actually by my colleague that there's already a separate highway code for Northern Ireland, so. Stuart, uh, Maureen, have you finished there? Because Stuart would quite like to ask, I think, a legal question on this, Stuart. Um, I'm directing this at the solicitor. She may not be able to answer it. Um, I'm aware that there are powers that the Scottish Parliament has over signage, which would allow the way... I, I know this as Transport Minister because... Uh, I had the power to redesign a lollipop lady's lollipop. Now, we didn't do it in a way that was visually particularly, uh, particularly different. It was because, simply because the black piece of plastic round the edge that the manufacturer had stopped making it the required width, so we had to change the spec. But the point is, the Scottish Parliament has powers over signage which could lead to differentiation. How widespread is that, or is that a question you'd need to uh, research more fully? Um, I am aware that uh, this is now, since the Scotland Act 2016, um, uh, within the devolved remit, but um, how far this goes and how that would work within um, uh, uh, with the Secretary of State, uh, whether that would have to be uh, with agreement and so on, I, I can research further and come back to on. Um, Claudia, I think you had a question there. Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Good morning to you, Mark, and to um, the panel. Uh, I'd, I'd like to take you back to the, um, what you were talking about, the cultural shift. And um, I found it interesting. I received earlier this week um, from Twenties Plenty um, the, uh, the UK organisation 
a poll which I understand has been done specifically in Scotland, um, which you have referred to, where 72% of those who express an opinion support the introduction of the 20 MPH default speed limits, and that this has risen from um, 65 in 2017. So I'm interested to know um, what you think the, the reasons for that, um, that shift, that cultural shift, which you've referred to already, are. And indeed, and uh, I, I, I don't know if there has been any breakdown of the reasons within the poll, but well, there probably haven't, but it would be too sophisticated, perhaps, an analysis. But if you could um, uh, just point to some of the things that you think are important in terms of the cultural shift, which might build confidence for the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a, a, a poll with a, with a single question. Uh, I think the, the evidence that come from areas which have implemented 20 uh, is more detailed. And in particular, the pilot that was done in Edinburgh uh, pointed to a range of reasons why 20 mile an hour is, is, is popular. And, you know, people feel safer, um, even with a modest reduction in average speed, that they feel safer in areas that are more likely to, um, you know, pick up a bike or, you know, let your, let your child out of the front door and cross a road. Um, so, you know, that, that's part of a, of a growing shift. And I think mm -hmm. as more 20 mile an hour limits roll out, albeit in a piecemeal way across Scotland, there's a growing awareness of the importance of road safety. So it, it's starting to tip. It's starting to tip. And I think some of the uh, evidence that's come out of Edinburgh, particularly with the, the study that Ruth Jepson ha has been leading, uh, which is now the biggest 21 hour study in the UK, um, again shows that opposition to 20 is, is declining as well. So some of the myths around, oh, well, you know, it's going to make the roads slower and it's, you know, it's going to increase pollution, all that, a lot, a lot of those issues are being, are being greater understood now and people are focusing on what the benefits are. Uh, to the feel of their communities and the livability of their communities and the confidence that it gives people to be living in a community with a safer speed limit. Um, so we are, we, are, we are at a tipping point. Um, and, yeah, I, I think, I think you know, the, all the evidence shows that that's getting stronger and stronger. But we still have a default 30, which we're continually trying to create exemptions from. Thank you. Um, Peter. I think you've got a question and then we're going to move on to question three and can I just say I mean I think it's very important that we we, we hear fully the answers or all of this but we've done two questions in in half an hour um, so um, if we can focus in um, mm. otherwise I'm just worried that of the numerous questions that we have we're not going to get through them all which which would uh, I, I, Mark, I wasn't looking at you. I'm just saying that there are a lot of questions, and I, and I think it's right that we, we try and drill into all of them. So, uh, Peter, and then we're going to go to question three, which will be John Finney. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, Mark. I mean, I want to explore a wee bit more. You, you've, you've made some fairly bold statements that all councils want to see this, this bill succeed and, and become law. I, I'm not sure that's, that's the case, because we did take evidence from Borders Council, for instance, and I, the feeling I got is they, they didn't want this. They, they are quite happy with what they've got. They, they, they see that there are areas that 20 miles is correct and there are areas that they don't want to be forced to go down that road because they, I think basically what they were saying, the level of accident in some of these rural villages is so minuscule that there is no need to change the, the, the default from 30. So, you know, what do you say to that? I, I mean, I probably need, need to clarify what I said, Mr Chapman, I, mean, I didn't say that every single council was in favour. I said that the, the vast majority were and have been supportive. We've had a lot of contact with them over the last um, two and a half years. I mean, I, I understand where Borders Council is coming from. Um, like many local authorities, there will be financial pressures. They need to decide um, where they want to put their, their resources. Um, they have a focus on, on KSIs, on major a and B roads in rural communities, um, and I understand why they may wish to do that. But I think the report that we've just provided the committee also shows that it, we need to also consider the serious injuries that happen on residential roads as well. And you know, the vast majority of people living in rural Scotland, including myself, live on streets which are restricted roads. They're street lit roads um, where children uh, live and play. And there are issues there. So we need to find the, the correct balance here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate Borders Council's point of view on this, which is that 
um, this isn't a cost saving for them because they weren't planning to introduce 20 mile an hour anyway. Well, if you look at it that way, then it, it is an, an, an additional cost. But you also need to look at the benefits um, and the savings to communities as well. And I, I, I don't think there's a difference between a child living in Newmarket or Afford or Alloa or the centre of Edinburgh. Um, you know, it's the same environment that my kids live up live in, in in rural Stirling as the kids live in in the centre of Edinburgh and it's important that they feel the benefits of 20 mile an hour. If that then becomes an issue of funding uh, about whether government should support councils that, that are rural councils um, that have identified challenges with the implementation of 20 then then so be it but you know it makes no difference to the child or the community or the family living in that street about whether they're living in a rural village or whether they're living in the centre of Edinburgh. They still face the same challenges with traffic. They still want to get out on their bikes um, uh, and, and walk and cycle to, to school. Um, and, and I don't see why they shouldn't have safer streets to do that. But I appreciate the fact that rural local authorities have challenged geography. Um, the point that the, the Borders Council made was that you know, these type of accidents in built up streets are, are minuscule small and and they didn't feel that this would have any significant difference at all because the, the figures that uh, as of now are, are virtually zero anyway that's the point they were making i mean i, I suppose just I, just to briefly um come back on on the point um and this is really in, in answer to mr stevenson's point as well um that, that if, if you turn to Table 5 of, of the report that was produced by um, Professor Adrian Davis, it, it does give you a figure for those who are seriously injured on built-up roads. And, and, and that, that's 787 people every single year. It's a, it's a cost of £167 million. Pounds. So this is a substantial cost. And I'm not saying for one minute that Borders Council don't take that, that into consideration. Um, but, but my point is that it, it's wrong for us to not consider the needs of people living in streets and the dangers that they that they face. And, and I, I, I yeah, uh, we are going to move on to the next question, John uh, Finney. John, it's you. Um, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, perhaps, convener, um, just prior to ans asking questions about reduction in casualties and uh, collisions. I'd like to refer to the letter that we got yesterday from the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland. Uh, it was directed to yourself and circulated to the, the committee. And indeed, uh, the Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland are, of course, the senior practitioners representing all of these local authorities. And the final uh, paragraph of their letter says, in summary, the Society maintains its general support of the Restricted Roads 20 Miles Scotland uh, Bill and its intentions. Um, uh, so, and, and the other, the other thing uh, I wanted to, people, uh, members will also be aware that 20 is plenty issued a press release yesterday, and uh, one of the, the lines covering the, if you like, the tension between central decision making and local costs is to say a national policy pays for itself in the first eight year for eight times less money than if the council implement 20 miles an hour individually at local level. I think that, again, is a compelling but uh, um, a piece of information. Uh, Mark, you um, referred to the World Health Organization. You talked about this as being a public health intervention, which is how I like to view it, more than talk about administrative processes or science for that matter. We heard from the Cabinet Secretary last week um, a cost, I don't like it being referred to in this way, of £2 million for, for a a fatality. Um, but looking around the evidence about reductions in collisions and casualties, um, in the SPICE briefing paper, we hear um, uh, about um, research done by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, and indeed we took information from them. I wonder, could you comment on the scenario one and two that uh, they, they allude to, please? Um, Sort of bringing up the um, um, reductions in casualties and, and fatalities and the cost they put to it. Yeah. 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 Before we go any further, can I just clarify something? The letter that referred to the Scots letter, I think, was sent to individual members. It wasn't sent through the committee uh, clerk. So can I just confirm that all members have... You, you haven't seen it, Jamie. Um, 
Well, it was it was sent to individuals. It wasn't sent to the committee. I, I received a copy. Um, so, if anyone on the committee hasn't received that letter, I'll make sure that you get it after that. But it wasn't circulated through the committee. Sorry, John. Okay, just for yeah, a I, I wasn't wanting to give them. I mean, I, I just assumed it. No, no. Well, I, 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 I was double checking because the clerks yeah, looked at me blankly, well, well, and I just well, wanted to certainly. make sure. So, okay. I mean, it should have been sent to the committee, but it wasn't. But yeah. if anyone hasn't got it, and I've noticed this, yeah, Richard hasn't got it, I'll make sure that you get a copy, and Jamie, I'll make sure that you okay. get a copy. Sorry, Mark, that probably gave you a brief interlude to find the information you needed. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, 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 we, we make an estimate in, in the bill of um, what the uh, benefits will be. Um, it is focused on improvements on road safety. Um, we haven't tried to estimate in pounds and pence what the public health benefits will be in terms of increased rates of walking and cycling, but I think we can assume that they will be, they will be um, substantial. Um, I mean, in terms of the work uh, by Glasgow Centre Population and Health, and we wanted to get an independent view on what the road safety benefits will be, the casualty reductions that we could expect to see um, from a, a modest reduction in average speed, and there are two scenarios associated with that. And that correlates uh, broadly with what we've uh, worked up ourselves to put into the, um, the financial memorandum of, of the bill. And um, instead of looking at the, the, the Glasgow Centre Population and Health um, figures, um, you know, the first scenario estimate 755 uh, fewer casualties, five fewer fatalities, and a cost saving of nearly £40 million every year. Uh, the second scenario, um, slightly less, um, 531 fewer casualties, three fewer fatalities, and a saving of £27 <coughs> million every year. So, you know, the, these, are, these are substantial um, figures. And, of course, what, they, what the figures don't tell us is what that human cost is of a loss of a life, you know, the, the cost to a community. Um, I experienced that m myself when I, was, when I was a young child. And um, although I didn't know the, the child involved very well, the, the impact on the whole school community and, and the family w was, was huge. And it stays with me to this day. And I, I think if you, if you look at, you know, not just the impacts of fatalities, but the impacts of severe injuries as well, the lifetime costs in terms of care, but also the impacts of near misses. Um, if somebody's involved in a near miss, uh, they come, come very close to, to being seriously injured. That, you know, that can affect their life chances. It can affect their choices going forward. I've met people who've been you know, nearly run over or knocked off with a minor, minor incident with their bike when they were younger, and they've never touched a bike again. So, you know, this perception also of how safe our communities are is, is hugely important. Um, I don't know if the, um, it might ask Mr. Milne to just explain a little bit more about the, the estimates in terms of the, these kind of hard savings um, that we identified in the bill. Is that, yep. Does that answer your question, partly, Mr. Finney? I, 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 I have to be honest, I'm uncomfortable with putting a sum beside a, a, a life, but I, I think given that cost is featured so much in this bill, and we've heard that the cost benefits, then in this crude way, yes, I would like to hear, please, because I, I, I think it is, it is important. Um, I mean, I don't know what price you put in a child's life in the loss of community, as, as has been said, but if Mr Milne has further information, that would be yes. helpful. Thank you. If you look at the financial memorandum, we put at the end of that some uh, uh, estimates of savings, um, and we've broken that down according to a number of different factors. And these are using standard figures that are widely used across government to uh, calculate costs. So uh, Table 4, for example, gives you the value of accidents prevented according to costs, likely costs on the police, and then we've got separate tables for the impact on the NHS. Um, table 6 is in some ways the most significant. I mean, this is the value of accidents prevented in terms of pain, grief and suffering, which is exactly the thing that I think, Mr Finney, you you're expressed some unease about. But the point is that these are absolutely standard figures that have been generated centrally within government as a tool for uh, policy analysis. So there has to be some way of quantifying the cost of fatalities, uh, and this is how it's done. It's sort of actuarial calculation. So, in a sense, it's, you could argue it's not real money, but it's it is a way of quantifying, uh, in some meaningful way, that you can use for comparative analysis, um, the, the the impact of uh, fatalities and serious injuries. So, we have simply used standard figures that are used, for, for example, when the NHS, is, as I understand it, are assessing the value of new 
medicines or interventions and which might save lives, they use these figures to, to calculate cost benefit. So, and it does give figures, I mean, we've come up with figures with a lower and higher estimate, and they, they are very similar to the ones that Mr. Ruskell just quoted, the higher estimate of 36.1 million pounds, which is very similar to the nearly 40 million pounds that was quoted as the higher estimate and so on. So I think it does demonstrate that you can, there is a standard methodology that you can use to, to get meaningful numbers for the, save, the potential savings that you can gain from something that saves lives. And, and can I ask as a supplement to that, do, do you have any evidence that a national 20 mile an hour speed limit on restricted roads would produce greater benefits in these areas than the current system? So the, the, the problem with the current system is that it's not delivering 20 mile an hour beyond zones outside of schools or if you're lucky to live in Edinburgh, you know, substantial number of residential streets, but it's not delivering those benefits universally on a population wide, wide basis in rural areas, in urban areas. And, you know, that's where this as an intervention uh, starts to deliver because it, it makes sense that if, if we apply this um, across the whole of Scotland, we'll get greater reductions in casualties and, uh, and, and more benefits um, over time. I mean, the, the Atkins report as well, which has been you know, discussed in, in, in committee uh, on several occasions, uh, also found that the wider the 20 mile an hour uh, area is, uh, the bigger, the broader the 20 mile an hour area is, the more effective it is in terms of reducing speed. You know, they did particular work looking at Brighton, which had a, a big rollout and found that there was a greater reduction in speeds in that area because of the extent of the rollout. And they also found that there were speed reductions on accompanying uh, roads, uh, A and B roads outside of that area as well. So it demonstrates the, the, the benefit of applying this in a nationally consistent way, uh, not just piecemeal zones outside of schools, but on wider um, area-wide basis on, uh, across the country. Thank you. And, and, and very briefly, if I may, please, I again want to refer to the SPICE briefing um, um, under the heading, do 20 mile an hour speed limits improve road safety? And they allude to uh, what's referred to as a systematic review of evidence in 20 mile an hour zones where physical tramming calving measures are present and the 20 uh, mile an hour speed limit areas published. Uh, this was in the Journal of Public Health and it says, and I quote here, that 20 mile an hour zones and limits are effective in reducing accidents and injuries. And we've heard a variety of um, uh, traffic speed and volume, as well as improving perceptions of safety. Can you expand a bit on that? You did earlier. What, why that might be important? Please. Well, we make choices in our everyday lives about, you know, how we get to work, whether we um, allow our children to walk to school or whether they need to be driven to school. Uh, and, and a lot of that is, is down to perception. Um, you know, I, I, I don't go outside of my house every morning with a speed gun and decide whether I'm, I'm going to send my child to walk to school or not. But I do have a feeling about what my community feels like in terms of whether it's safe or not. And I believe it, it is a safer community as a result of a 20 mile an hour limit. So the perception is important. And I think some of the research that's been done, particularly around the Edinburgh pilot and in the Atkins study as well, um, points to the fact that people feel safer where they have 20 mile an hour in the streets where they live, work and play, and that this has a, a, has a positive impact in terms of those choices. The impact isn't exclusively on young people, older people in social mobility as well? Um, I, I'm not aware of, of, a, of a breakdown of, of particular you know, types of people, but I think you know, the, the benefits could be most keenly felt with those who are, who are vulnerable. And if you, we've had support from you know, disability organisations and, and those that represent people who are, who are vulnerable, um, not just children. Um, and of course, you know, active travel, people who are walking and cycling are, are by their very nature vulnerable in a road environment where they're mixing with motorised vehicles. So you know, this is where the global consensus is at the moment with WHO and the OECD saying that 20 mile an hour limits should be the norm where vulnerable road users mix with motorists, mix with vehicles. Uh, it's a safer speed limit that, that promotes those, those activities. So yes, I think any, any vulnerable road user will, will feel more, more vulnerable 
um, as a result of higher speed traffic. Um, Thank you. The next question is from John Mason, and I am going to have to start being quite strict on time now if we're to get through all the questions. So, John. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I mean, following on, in one of your answers to John Finney, you said, uh, if you're lucky to live in Edinburgh. Now, I just wonder, is it a question of luck that Edinburgh has got a 20 mile per hour zone? Or is it something to do with local democracy? And I mean, I mean, I thought the Greens were very much in favour of local democracy, and it surprises me a bit that there's such an emphasis on a national policy here, which appears to be imposing on local authorities. So I realise you've been asked something like that before, but could you, could you just explain... I mean, the present system, it seems to me, is very much driven by local authorities. Um, this system... OK, the local authorities would still have a bit of uh, leeway, but it would be imposing something pretty new on local authorities, would it not? I think it's important to get the balance right here. Um, we have a system of national speed limits um, for restricted roads, for A roads, for B roads, for motorways. Um, we don't uh, sort of encourage local authorities to make up their own limits for you know, the A roads and the B roads, so it's different in South Lanarkshire compared to Glasgow. So we have that national consistency. I think that, that is important. It's in the, the statute law, and we need to go with the grain of that in terms of this bill. However, you make an important point, which is about local discretion around the setting of 20 mile an hour limits and the integration of the restricted roads with other roads within an urban area. And I think that is very much about the locality. It's about the community. It's about how it functions. It's about having that discussion with other road users like the bus companies and the hauliers and others. And that, that's where the local discretion comes in. So I'm not proposing getting rid of nationally set speed limits, but I am proposing using the current system in a way that's more cost effective because it looks at exemptions rather than trying to create a new rule by continually creating exemption after exemption after exemption. Okay, well, I mean, I mean, I do accept that whatever system we have, there's going to be a mixture of national and local. And I suppose I'm interested, again, some have asked you already about, you know, how much interaction you've had with local authorities. I mean, it seems to me there's kind of three broad options here. One is to continue with the present system. Two is, is your plan to have 20 and restricted roads. And another option is to actually make the 20 more widespread, because one of my concerns in this is that you go through a village or you go through a city like mine and you're going to have signs absolutely everywhere and every junction's going to have either a 30 or a 20 on it. So part of me actually would like to go further and say, right, the whole of Glasgow is going to be 20 and then the council can make exceptions to that if it wants. So could you guys, well, explain why you're thinking the restricted roads is the right way, but also uh, is, do you think that's what local authorities, out of all these options, is that their preference? Well... I mean, restricted roads, the definition of restricted road is that it's a C, an unclassified minor road, which is also street lit. And I think that accurately defines the kind of streets that need to be 20 miles an hour because they are largely residential um, in character. In terms of whether we'd want to include A or B roads within this context, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm certainly not proposing a default, changing the default speed limit for B roads in Scotland to 20 miles an hour. That, that, would, that would not make sense at, at, at all. Um, however, some areas, indeed, it will make sense in a in a in a minority of roads, particularly in an urban context, um, where it's in, that A and B network within an urban context um, is part of that community and maybe residential in character. And I think you've already heard some evidence from last week um, from Scots where they identified that some local authorities have already taken some A and B roads in that urban context and re restricted them. So those would go. They've been restricted for good reason, and they will go to 20 unless councils choose otherwise. Um, but I think it's important to have that discretion for councils to make a decision. And you know, to go back to Mr Rumble's point again, I've thought about Afford and I've thought about communities in my own region that are very similar. And it, there, is, there does need to be discretion there from local authorities about whether they would wish to see a through road incorporated into a wider 20 network or whether they would wish to retain that at 30 or a higher speed. And therefore that would require additional signage in terms of entry and exit point onto that through road. But that's a local decision. And, 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 you know, that, that needs to be taken by councillors working with communities uh, in order to do that. It can't be done centrally here, nor should it be.
I mean, you seem to be indicating that restricted, it's very clear what restricted roads are, but I mean, I think one of my colleagues is going to ask more about this, but I mean, we have had some evidence that local authorities are not that clear and can't give us a figure as to um, how many miles of restricted roads there, there are. So, and, and therefore that takes me back to my first point as to how can we decide which is the best way of doing it if we're not that clear about what are the restricted roads. The, the, the letter that you've had from, from Scots that I hope members of the committee have, have had um, in the last day, I think, shows quite clearly that uh, a number of local authorities have, you know, clear understanding of where restricted roads are and have done that work. Um, other local authorities are on their way to achieving that. Um, I mean, yes, there are, there are challenges there. Um, but, you know, the restricted roads category is, is, is pretty clear. It's C or unclassified roads that are, that are street lit. Uh, it doesn't include the A and B roads unless they've been restricted under order. If they've been restricted under order, there, there's copies of those orders that are available. So, um, although this may be a challenge for some local authorities, um, you know, it, 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 it's, not, it's not rocket science. Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, there's substantial reassurance from the body that represents heads of transportation that, that this is doable. Um, can, I, can I just come back and clarify something on that, Mark? My understanding from the Scots letter that 50% of councils had worked out what the uh, restricted roads were and, and that the others were in partly through the process or, or not completed at all. You've just said that local councils knew where the restricted roads were. It, it, it seems to me I, I, I'm slightly confused. I was confused at the last evidence session what was a, classed as a restricted road. So is, is Scott's letter that was circulated yesterday and now is circulated formally by the committee has gone to people's emails. Is that wrong? More than 50% of councils know where or is it just, as Scott said, 50% of councils know? No, I mean, um, uh, the, the Scots letter um, stands um, on, on its own. I mean, they've been doing more detailed work uh, with local authorities. Um, they've gone beyond where we've got to with the policy and financial memorandum, uh, and they're looking at the individual circumstances that local authorities are in. Um, you know, we, we, we don't have uh, listings of, of restricted, a complete list of restricted roads nationally and, and totals for that in Scotland. That's partly as a consequence of the default blanket 30 mile an hour limit that we currently have. Um, what Scots are saying is, mm. is for, for the proposals in the bill to be effective, there's a requirement for coordination and resources to monitor and maintain the data required, mm -hmm. which says that they don't have the data effectively. Is, is that incorrect? Um, I mean, the councils have a range of data. so. Let's go back to... Sorry, I'm... I'm, I'm so if I could Mark, explain... if I could just ask yeah. you specifically, uh -huh. is Scots right in what they're saying in that letter that, that the councils don't have all the data or are they not right? Uh, the, the, the letter is right, however... Can I just... Right, that, that's can fine. I just on that's, interpretation no, of the no, letter... I'm fine, because well, there's other people who want to come in on this, okay. so I'm going to bring we Stuart to and then I'm going to bring you in, John. I, I've asked my question, so Stuart, if you'd like to come in and then John. Um, it's just to try and home in and what's going on here. Um, my understanding is that all councils know where the restricted roads are because they have databases that do that. Certainly Aberdeenshire does and you can go onto the website and look them all up. But what, the, what I understand is not known is which of those restricted roads fall within the definition here of the, 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 in relation to the lighting. That that is the difficulty. Now, I think that's consistent with Scots, what Scots are saying, but I'm a little uncertain. Is that the specific difficulty that's being referred to by councils, which I recognise is a difficulty, I hasten to, hasten to add. So, so the definition of restricted roads in, in Scotland, which I gather is different to, to England, is that these are C or unclassified roads that are also street lit. Now, every local authority, I know from my days as a councillor, has an asset register of where their street lights are because they maintain them. Uh, they're on maintenance schedules. So I think Mr. Stevenson's correct in saying that local authorities do know where the restricted roads are. They also know where the roads that aren't restricted are, the A's and the B roads and the motorways. Um, 
The issue perhaps is about looking at where the variation has occurred over time and where an order has been applied for over time to bring in potentially A and B roads as part of a wider network. Can I just intervene network. to try and cut to the chase? Yeah. The, while the councils have got a database of all their C and unclassified roads, mm. they don't know which of those in that database are restricted because it's a different database as the street lighting in general terms, but equally, even though they have an asset register of the street lighting, is it correct to say they do not necessarily know whether the street lights are 185 metres apart or more, which is what would lead you to be able to identify? Is, is that the area of difficulty that we're experiencing and what we're hearing? I mean, that that's not a an issue which has been raised with me in the last two and a half years with Scots. However, um, it's an interesting point and certainly something which I would imagine Scots would be uh, you know, prepared to engage with Mr Stevenson and, and the committee on if you felt that was substantial. However, it hasn't been raised with me and I've had extensive engagement with Scots and councils over the last, the last two years. Um, yeah. John, you wanted to come in and then we're going to move to Jeremy Green. Yeah, it's very briefly, and in, in, in part because it, it's a damning indictment on our local authorities if they don't know what, they, what, what they're responsible for. That's that they are custodians of public uh, property. Um, certainly Highland Council used to be able to tell you every lay-by they owned, every salt deposit area. Um, similarly, I've had an asset register breakdown from Argyll and Butte. With the definition, and you, you say maybe there's a confusion, and I'm disappointed with focus on, uh, once again on road signs, there is no dubiety that the council is required to maintain lighting in the areas that you're talking about, so they, by default, must know where the, these areas yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think that was the point we're I was gonna, trying to make. We're going to move on to the next question, which is Jamie Green. Jamie. Thank you. Um, and I, I do feel we're not just focusing on road signs. This is actually a very important issue because... In, if you read the overview of the bill, it says the main purpose of the bill is to reduce the general speed limit on restricted roads to 20 miles per hour. That, in effect, is the premise of the bill, and it's the uh, the, the route that you've chosen to take to introduce uh, rather than other approaches which may have been discussed. So I do think it's important we get to the bottom of this issue. Can I just ask some uh, simple questions around that to inform the committee? Uh, as the lead member responsible for this bill, do you know how many restricted roads there are in Scotland. So that information about a total road length of restricted roads um, does not exist um, because of the issues that we've, we've just um, discussed. I have to say that's a question that I asked two and a half years ago because I felt it would be quite simple to say, well, here's the total road length of restricted roads in Scotland, times that up by a certain number of signs, and therefore that gives you an understanding of what the costs would be. However, I was informed and told by roads officers and people who are professional in this area that, you know, that, that's not the way to work out how this, this costs. The way to work out how this costs is to look at where 20 mile an hour has been rolled out already, to look at um, specifically uh, Angus Council, where we took a model, financial costing model based on Angus Council, where we look at real settlements and what the signage requirements will be. And I think that, that, that makes sense because obviously if you're in an urban area, a large urban area, a large urban conurbation, and there will be fewer entry and exit points out of a suburban area onto a through road than there will be in a smaller rural village. So in a way, you need to look at what the roads are in Scotland and how the types of settlements that we have and build out an understanding of what the costs are and the implementation phases on that, rather than taking a figure and going, oh, well, I'll times so, that by sorry, 20. Sorry and we've got I, I get, we are going to talk about costs later mm. in the session. I don't want to impose on other members who have questions on that. So uh, you've sort of preempted the reasons to why I'm asking the question. Uh, I'm asking for just some simple data. We're getting to the fifth evidence session of this, but no one's been able to answer the, some very basic questions, such as how many restricted roads are there in Scotland? What's the total mileage of those? What percentage of roads are restricted roads? And indeed, as we heard from the last evidence session, how many B roads are also designated restricted roads in Scotland? We had some evidence around specifically West Lothian, given by one panellist, but I have no idea how that correlates to other local authorities who may also have B roads. So what I'm asking for is, have you in the last two and a half years been able to answer any of these fundamental questions to give us an idea simply of the scale of the effect of the overview of the bill? Um, 
so in terms of creating national totals around restricted roads, no. But then, as, I, as I've already pointed out to you, this is a question that needs to be answered at a local level. And what we have done is work with Scots on thinking through what an implementation plan would look like, the phase of work that local authorities would need to do to establish the exact layout of restricted roads within their area, which roads they would wish to retain as 30, and then plan to put up the signs and introduce the traffic orders to maintain that, that final network. Um, so it, it is a level of, of implementation uh, that we've been informed by councils needs to happen after the bill is, is enacted and to have a decent time scale between achieving rural assent, if it does achieve rural assent and implementation, to allow councils to do that detailed work. Um, that there isn't, unfortunately, a magic figure that, that exists out there. If, if there, it, if is there un, it is unfortunate because it, I think it would help put the premise of the bill in some context. It's unfortunate that no one's been able to answer those questions, either the bill team or the local authorities in question. Um, the letter that we did get yesterday, which thank you to the clerks for forwarding it to us, is quite clear. It says, it may be accurate to state we do not know the number of restricted roads in Scotland. It then goes on to say that nearly a third have no limited asset data to allow roads to be identified. So my question is, at this stage, in proceedings as we're uh, going forward with the bill, nearly uh, a third of local authorities still uh, not just do not know the answer to that question, but feel that they don't even have the data to answer that question. So it seems to me that there's still a problem uh, there in terms of the, uh, the, the available data. I'm not saying whose fault that is or whose duty it is to collate it there. We can have a discussion around that, but it still seems to me there's a fundamental problem with n knowing and identifying which roads this bill will affect. And that, to me, seems quite like a, fund a fundamental flaw. There. I mean, I, I would say it, it, it's a challenge which is well recognised. It's been well recognised um, since the inception of the development of this bill and is incorporated into the thinking around timescale for implementation and the kind of work the local authorities would need to do. So, you know, we, we've had very detailed conversations with those that would uh, have to implement this bill about what would be required to provide that certainty and then to enable councils to go on and do that work with stakeholders and identify which roads they wish to retain as 30. So, um, so yes, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that, that this can be uh, addressed. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the next questions, uh, which are from Mike Rumbles. Mike. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> Mark, one of, one of my major concerns about the, the bill is that from the evidence that we've received, particularly from rural councils, is that they, they feel there's going to be a disproportionate financial impact on, on rural councils and rural authorities, um, which puts into question whether the financial memorandum is fit for purpose that's been produced for it. Um, we've heard that, for instance, if I can just preface it by just saying, even where a successful council has done really good work with 20 mile an hour zones like Edinburgh, the evidence that they've given us is it's going to cost them nearly a million pounds to adjust for, the, for this bill, taking down repeated signs, etc. So that's going to cost a million per se. Then we've got uh, rural councils such as Highland, who do know, I mean, they, they gave us an evidence that they would have 700 kilometres of um, restricted roads. And if I refer to the evidence that Borders Council gave us, they said, well, hang on, well, the accidents that have occurred in the borders are really to do with vehicles that are reversing, vehicles at very low speed. This issue isn't, from their perspective, uh, important enough to decide where to put their financial resources. It will cost rural councils a hugely disproportionate amount of money to implement this on the, on the grounds that you, you mentioned effort, I've mentioned effort, of course, if you just take one village in Aberdeenshire, um, I worked out that in AFA, they'd, they'd have to put up, instead of having one sign, entry and exit from the village, over 40 entry and exit signs. And that's going to be repeated in every village in, in our rural authorities uh, across the country. It will be an enormous cost. Do you have any response to that? OK, um, th there's quite a few um, issues in there, and I, you know, Thank Mr. Rumbles for, for raising some specific examples because sometimes we need to drill down into that to truly understand it. Um, in terms of costs, um, 
The bill is largely predicated on estimates that were provided by Angus Council. Uh, now, Angus Council, as we all know, is, is you know, fairly similar to uh, much of rural Scotland. It has a, a mixture of urban uh, towns and conurbations. It has smaller villages. It has hamlets. Um, and I believe those costings are, are accurate. I mean, in, in discussions with Angus Councils, they've factored in the re possible requirement for buffer zones. Um, they've factored in the, yes, I agree, inevitably higher costs of introducing signage in a relatively small um, village. Um, so, so, you know, the, the, particularly the costs for entry signage uh, are, for Scotland are based on Angus. Um, so there's a rural waiting in the bill. Um, the, the, the costings have been weighted um, towards those that rural local authorities would would um, you know have to have to shoulder. Um, I, I think there are there are there are issues then about uh, you know whether there's a disproportionate cost between one local authority compared to another, um, and I think it's important that um, if this was to go through that the Scottish Government could look at a way to equalise some of those costs. Um, I appreciate that if you're in Clapmanninshire and you've already introduced 20 mile an hour on every single road and you're the smallest local authority in Scotland, you'll have less costs in terms of uh, integrating your current scheme signage into a national default, taking down a few repeater signs, than you would say for Highland Council, um, which has got a larger geographic area uh, and would have more costs. So I, I think it, you know, it's important to recognise that. Um, but I would also say that the majority of rural councils, of course, back this. Um, Aberdeenshire were one of the few local authorities that was neutral on this. Um, board has had concerns, but you know, Highland Council, you mentioned Highland Council back this. Um, you know, they, they support it. Uh, Orkney Council uh, back it. Um, you know. Angus Council back it, Stirling Council back it, numerous uh, community council, councils across Scotland um, back this approach as well. So the, the question about equalisation of costs according to uh, the need of rural local authorities is a very valid issue that I think you raise. Um, but but I, I, I believe that the, the, the national estimates that we provided um, are accurate and I've not seen figures that really show that, um, you know, that, that we've underestimated in many ways. I mean, I, I guess the, the, the frustration is, perhaps I have, is in terms of getting a clear understanding at this point from the Scottish Government about how they might change the signage regulations. Because clearly, if they decided to change the signage regulations to require repeater signs to remain up in 20 mile hour zones currently, or to reduce the requirement for 30 repeaters, uh, that could substantially reduce the, the cost of, of the bill even further. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that for committee at, at this point. Um, yeah, press you on the point you're making about the support of rural councils in particular for the bill. I mean, I signed your bill to, to, uh, uh, your motion to allow the bill to come forward because I'm very much in favour of 20 mile an hour. The question I have to ask myself on this committee is, is this the, having seen the bill and taken the evidence and interrogated people on this, is this the best approach? And I'm just concerned that I've heard so much evidence from, I was particularly taken by the evidence from Borders Council, that they, A, don't think a blanket approach for 20 mile an hour will save lives, because the evidence they gave the committee was that in the very small instances when there are accidents in these areas. It tends to be, as I say, reversing vehicles, vehicles at low speed anyway. And at a time of financial constraints, why should they be spending a huge amount of money to solve a system from their point of view doesn't exist? And the question I'm going to ask is really, how recent are all these rural councils saying they support the bill? Because if I had been asked if I supported the bill um, before I heard the evidence, I would have said, yes, I'm not so sure now. Well, I, I, would, I would point to not just the uh, consultation that, that I ran at, at the beginning of this process um, when, when we discussed the bill, but also the, your own consultation, the responses that you've had to this committee from councils. Um, you've obviously taken evidence from one who's in favour, one against, 
Um, you've had discussions with Highland Council, but you know, the majority of councils are in favour. And I've, I've, I've run seminars in Parliament um, over the last two years for councils to discuss the issues around 20 implementation. And I've had rural councils such as East Lothian come to me and say, you know, we're not, we're not doing 20 anymore. We're not doing it anymore. Because every time we try and introduce a 20 zone, we get 55 objections and 50 of them are from the same person. So we're not doing this anymore. We're waiting for your bill to be enacted. So we have significant numbers of local authorities that are now not rolling out 20 because they want a national default. And a significant number of those are rural councils. So this is what they're, they're waiting for. I mean, I, I did earlier on talk about, you know, the, the, the views of, of borders, and I, I accept that. Uh, this isn't a priority of them. But I would, you know, point again to the report that's been furnished for the committee from Adrian Davis that shows the numbers of people who are seriously killed in built-up areas in Scotland is significant. Those are built-up areas that are in my rural community, they're in your rural community, they're not exclusively in the centre of Edinburgh and cities. They're everywhere where children and vulnerable people live. Uh, can I just ask one question before we move on to the next one, because you've neatly led on, on to that. I, I was just having a look round, and I, I, I mean, I just drove through Keith at the weekend, you know, on the A96, which would be uh, not covered by the 20 mile an hour speed limit. And boringly, I counted 60 plus streets off the, the main road, each which would require signage one way and the other way. And I then went and looked around to find where the schools were and whether they were on that road. And I looked at the traffic on that road with the traffic lights. And, and truthfully, I didn't see it would make much difference, the, 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 uh, the signage and, and the law there. But it would be a vast cost. Do you think that, that probably is, is that reflected in many rural areas? Or do you think Keith is just exceptional? Um, Keith I, is exceptional, by the way. You're right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. Um, I, I mean, I suppose I'm a little bit parochial in this in that I spent a lot of time driving around Fife, and, and I have seen the way that Fife Council have implemented 20. And there are some communities, um, such as Burnt Island, Aberdara, where the council has decided to take that through arterial road and also make that 20 as well. Um, because it makes sense for that community, the way people cross the streets, the way they access services, shops, the tourists that you have, the railway station, the police station, etc. Um, but that, that's very much a, a decision based on the needs of, of that locality. It may be different uh, in a rural community which has less uh, of, of a residential character and is more arterial in nature. But those are decisions to be made locally. Um, I think you did... You, and, Sorry. and I'm going to stop yeah. you there, just for the simple reason, yeah. because that very okay. neatly leads on to Colin. And I'm going to bring Colin in, because you might want to ask some questions on that. Thank, that, that thanks very much, Convener. When, when the uh, Cabinet Secretary gave evidence to the committee, he seemed to suggest that he supported the concept of 20 mile an hour, but his view was this wasn't the bill to deliver that. This wasn't the best method to achieve that. How would you respond to that, and what alternatives to this proposal have you looked at to deliver 20 mile an hour? So, uh, I'm, I'm not clear what the alternatives would actually be. I mean, we've had a, a discussion about, um, you know, in, in, in your committee about streamlining the traffic regulation order process, for example. Um, but, but there's nothing inherently wrong with the traffic regulation order process. It's a system that's been designed to create exceptions from a, from a rule. So it, it, simply streamlining a process uh, to enable more and more exemptions from a rule, uh, that doesn't make sense. I mean, why not just change the rule and then continue to apply the regulation order process on the streets where you want to retain those? Um, as 30 mile an hour. So I, I, I don't see what the alternatives actually are at this point. Again, I would point to some of the views coming from local authorities that they're either stopping the rollout of 20 mile an hour because they're waiting uh, for this bill uh, uh, to, be, to be enacted, uh, or, or they, they support the provisions of, of, of what we're attempting to do. I'm not clear what the alternative is. I mean, the, the system that we have at, at the moment is very painful and very slow for those local authorities that want to create a new default in their residential areas. Um, and for other local authorities, it, it's not delivering uh, the kind of uh, protection um, that we see for, for communities in, you know, from 20 mile an hour. So, 
So, so, so in your discussions with, with, with government over this issue, at no time have they put forward an alternative proposal? Uh, I've, I've not had that feedback. I mean, we've had, um, you know, detailed discussion with the previous uh, Transport Minister, Hamza Youssef. It was very constructive. Uh, we've been working with um, Transport Scotland officials who, who came to give evidence last week um, over quite a long period of time. Um, the direction of travel has been to consider this proposal. Um, at no point has it been put to me that, that there's, there's an alternative uh, waiting there to be, to be brought in through streamlining TROs or removing the requirement for repeater signs or anything else. And the view I'm getting from local authorities is that, is that while some of those uh, potential streamlining of TROs may, may have some benefit, um, it, it's not going to fundamentally change the, the policies that they have at, at the moment. No organisation you've spoken with has said if you streamline TROs, that will deliver 20 mil an hour any, any faster than what we're delivering at the moment. To be honest, I mean, I did ask that question, you know, almost two years ago. Um, you know, is there, is there a simpler way to do this? Uh, is it about me, you know, lobbying the Scottish <laughs> Government for more funding or, or streamlining TROs or whatever? And, and the answer I've consistently had back is, no, a national default does make sense. So this is why I'm, I'm sitting here today at the end of a very long journey uh, that I've been on. Uh, and and I, at no point have I heard an alternative that will actually achieve the objective of what this bill is trying to achieve, which is to ensure there's a safer speed limit on the streets where people live, work and play. Okay. Do you want to do the question? I suppose one, one, one side issue is that, um, I mean, I, I'm presuming that the TRO system would be, will be used, but how would, I, how would you expect a local authority to deal with the process of having to reimpose a 30 mile an hour zone um, on a restricted road, um, particularly where residents were in favour of that being 20 mile an hour, and it would be by default be 20 mile an hour as a result of your bill? So again, this comes back to the important implementation phase. And again, we've, we've discussed with councils and Scots how this would work. I think what we wouldn't want to see is a situation where a 20 mile an hour default limit um, is brought in for restricted roads and then six months or a year, year later there's a debate about oh well maybe we should bring it back to 30 again what do you think or maybe we should keep it as 20. This needs to be as seamless as possible and that means that there's a need for a, a, a a substantial amount of time to allow local authorities to do several things. One, to bottom out the exact nature of their restricted roads. Secondly, to consult with communities and stakeholders, including the bus companies, who of course have legal obligations to stick to timetables um, as to which roads should be retained as 30. And then a third phase of phased rollout of the signage. So it's important within that implementation phase to have that discussion with communities up front about where there is a case to retain 30 miles an hour and where it's appropriate. And I have to say there will be, there will be cases where we need to retain 30 miles an hour and for very good reason, because many of our roads are arterial uh, in, in nature. Um, so, but you know, that needs to happen ahead of the implementation date uh, of, of the bill. Peter, yours is the next question. Mark, there's, there, we've heard evidence and we, we've, we've seen some robust evidence that the 20 mile an hour limits that are in place just now are regularly flouted. In fact, you know, we see that speed limit speeds have only dropped by one or one and a half miles an hour. And very often that's because the, the traffic is so, you know, it's so, it's so busy that physically the traffic can only travel at 24 miles an hour and that's what you, that's what you end up with. So what we're seeing is that the 20 miles an hour that, that, that do exist are regularly flouted. And we've also heard from police in Scotland saying that they, they wouldn't put any extra resource in place to, to enforce the 20 miles per hour limit because they haven't got any other uh, resource. So my, my question is really, if, if people get used to the fact that you know, they can flout the 20 miles an hour limit on a regular basis and do, is this going to have a, an effect on the, the general per, perception that 60 mile an hour and 70 mile an hour speed limits can be flouted as well? Because, you know, this is what we do on a regular basis in Edinburgh and, and, and we can do it elsewhere. Just, just, Mark, just 
Just before you answer that question, if I could just make an observation that the evidence that we heard from uh, the police who, when they visited the committee was subsequently corrected and they did make, make it clear that if you're going to do over 20 in Edinburgh, they will enforce it and they do have the capability to enforce it. I don't want anyone feeling um, that w what they heard at that committee uh, session gave them the ability to break the law but the police made it clear they will enforce it. So that what they said is that they would choose where they chose to enforce it based on accident black spots. So if I could just clarify that, and, and Mark, sorry, if I could let you go back to your question. Convener, and um, thank you, Mr Chapman, for that. Um, I mean, the current situation we have with 30 mile an hour roads is that over half of people traveling on 30 mile an hour roads break the speed limit. Uh, they go faster than, than 30 miles an hour. So we, we have a, a, a compliance issue uh, in relation to 30. Um, if you look at the numbers of people going between 20 and 24 miles an hour on a 20 mile an hour speed limit road, it's broadly similar in terms of compliance with those traveling on a 30 mile an hour road. So I, I don't think we're seeing a dramatically different issue in terms of compliance. The, the issue for the police, obviously, yeah. is that they have limited resources. They don't have the officers at the moment uh, to stand on every single street corner on a 30 mile an hour road with a speed camera and, and enforce that, which is why an approach towards education and also amplifying the enforcement activity so that when people, you know, as, as the convener's just done in this session, that the perception that you may be uh, caught speeding uh, and that speeding is socially unacceptable becomes more the norm, and we, and we um, transform social attitudes over, over time with that. But the, the important point, I think, that was raised again by this report, which we've just circulated to, to committee, um, is that the police do recognise that they need to put in place some upfront enforcement with this bill uh, to become law. That's something that Stuart Carl um, has commented in, in in this report which we've furnished to committee. So the police recognise that they have a role to play, partly in education, but partly uh, in terms of targeting their enforcement activity uh, on roads where um, speeding is, is, is particularly high. Um, yeah, I don't... Uh, because I know Mike's got a question. Or you, Mike, why don't you come in with yours and then I'll come back to you, Peter. Th th thank you. I just wanted to challenge Mark's response there because it's con contrary to the information we have from the SPICE briefing about enforcement. It's quite clear in the SPICE briefing the information there. I don't have it in front of me, but I remember the evidence that we used, which was when people are driving the 30 mile an hour zone, most motorists and the average speed of motorists is within the law. When people are driving in a 20 mile an hour zone, uh, certainly in Edinburgh, that was the evidence from Spice, that most people and the average speed uh, that people undertake is more than 20 miles an hour. So what we've got a situation, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, I'm just, I'm just giving, uh, wanting to, you to address the facts here. The facts are that with a 30 mile an hour zone, most people are law abiding. And within a 20 mile an hour zone, most people are not law abiding. Do you accept that? So I come back to that figure again that most people driving on a 30 mile an hour road are breaking the law. They are driving at more than 30 miles an hour. And perhaps, you know, even more importantly that, than that, they're driving at a speed which, if they hit a pedestrian, they'll be seven times more likely to survive. Evidence that the committee received with the Spice Briefing, the Spice so, Briefing for Edinburgh, and I think John might have it in front of him. Uh, no, so what, sorry, maybe if, if I could come so briefly back on the point about are we, are we criminalising people effectively by dropping the speed limit. The, the, there's a sort of rule of thumb, if you like, that the, that the police um, apply to uh, detection and, and prosecution of people who are, who are speeding. And it's a kind of um, a, an acceptable variance, let's say, from the speed limit. And that rule of thumb is 10% uh, of the speed limit plus two miles an hour. So if you look at the numbers of people driving on a 20 mile an hour road who are traveling between 20 and 24 miles an hour, it's broadly the same, it's broadly the same levels of compliance with 30 miles an hour. So I don't, I don't get a sense that, um, that we're sort of criminalizing a large number of people by dropping the speed limit. 
Um, and in fact, over time, as people understand the implications uh, of driving at a higher speed, and they understand the implications if they get caught driving at a higher speed, then speed limits will drop further. I mean, essentially what the SPICE briefing um, does, and there's a, it's difficult to describe because there's a, there's a table here, but what, what sorry, a graph rather, um, it was on page two from one of your previous weeks, but, and this is from, I think, from DFT um, statistics, but effectively what it shows is that the range of vehicle speeds from, the, from the, those who are breaking the speed limit at 39 mile an hour down to those going at 20, under 20 mile an hour, that range of speeds shifts on 20 roads from towards 20 miles an hour. I've got it right in front of me now, yeah. kindly produced by John Finney. And on page six, it says the average speed, this is about Edinburgh, the average speed of vehicles on the streets provided with a 20 mile an hour speed limit has dropped by an average of one point mile an hour from 22.8 miles an hour to 20.9 miles an hour. So when it dropped, when the speed limit was 30 miles an hour, the average speed was 22.8. Most people were obeying the law. When it was dropped to 20 miles an hour, the average speed was over 20 miles an hour. It's quite clear in the Spice Briefing of the Edinburgh statistics. Surely we should accept the statistics that the Spice Briefing has produced. Very briefly on that, I mean, that's an average speed reduction. So an average is made up of a number of people driving at different speeds, some of them going very fast, some of them going slower than the average speed. And, and you divide it by the number of drivers and you end up with an average speed reduction. So that doesn't tell you that everybody is suddenly driving at 1.9 miles an hour slower. What it shows, and I think what some of the studies in Edinburgh show, is that on the higher speed roads, you get a greater reduction of speed greater reduction of speed than drivers driving on a slower speed road. And it stands to reason, because if you implement 20 mile an hour on a road where it's difficult to drive at 20 mile an hour because it's incredibly narrow and it's residential in character, then speed reduction obviously will be very low on that road once it's had a 20 mile an hour limit imposed. However, if you're putting 20 mile an hour on a road which is faster, then of course you'll get a greater reduction. So this is an average. It's not a kind of... Um, um, I mean, I'll look at Stuart Stevens on that one. Uh, Mark, I'm trying to get you to look at me because okay, you will have, uh, and, and, and I give, give you a huge amount of credit for attending every evidence session to doing this, and you will have heard me say that when I waggle my pen, um, you're probably getting to the end of your answer. And I know Malachi would like to come in, so I'd like to bring him in, and then I'd like to go on to, uh, to Stuart and then come back to Peter. So, Malachi, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to answer that to say the second SPICE briefing that was presented to the committee showed that 52% uh, of drivers on a road with a 30 mile an hour speed limit exceed those speeds. So, most speed drivers are going above 30. Um, but the point clearly is that at 20.9 miles per hour is not breaking the law and the police are not going to stop anyone and tell them that if they were driving at 20.9 miles per hour that they, that they get a ticket and they've said as much. Well, I, I, I think the point is, is it's very easy to buy into a reduction of a speed limit to 20 miles an hour in Edinburgh if you're never doing 20 miles an hour because of the traffic conditions. Well, but that may be a different argument. I'm going to bring in Stuart and, 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 and then I'll go back to Peter and then move on to the next question. Um, just a very brief one and then a slightly less brief one. Um, is the member aware of the construction and use regulations that covers um, the calibration of speed of speedometers in vehicles actually provides that they only have to be accurate to plus or minus 10%. That is why the 10% uh, issue, because you may be, you, you legally can be sitting in your car, your speedometer is reading 30 miles an hour, your actual speed can legally be 33 miles per hour. So therefore, that's why the 10% actually exists. So therefore, if you were to be stopped and taken to court at 33 miles an hour, you would have a legal defence that your speedometer was saying 30 miles an hour. And that, that's why that, is that your understanding? I saw nodding heads, so I don't think I need a response to that. Your question. Yeah. Um, but it, it's just, so therefore 20.1 is actually within the 22 miles an hour limit. Now, it, 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 it was really just to, to, to pick up on uh, the, the report that uh, the Transport Research Institute has helpfully provided 
we've covered a lot of it. But there's a little bit uh, on page three, at paragraph three. General agreement, greater levels of road traffic policing results in lower numbers of collisions and injuries and traffic uh, violations. And w we've got a conflict here in that uh, when I move to page four, the report that in essence, the police are not uh, particularly uh, forcing, uh, at the very end above the footnotes on page four, um, that, that uh, they, they're basically enforcing in r r rural areas where the speeds are higher rather than urban areas. And yet in the, in the casualties numbers, we see uh, that the majority of uh, uh, f fatal and serious are actually in built up roads and urban areas. Is that an issue really that the police in their observations that provided the committee so far have adequately addressed? Although I do note uh, again that the report says that the police intend uh, to have at least a six month period of special enforcement after the implementation of this bill. Um, I just briefly answer that by saying that, you know, we've had detailed engagement with, with Police Scotland. We recognise that they are in a difficult position. They have resource constraints. They need to prioritise where they can deliver the, the, the most public benefit in terms of their policing. But it was part of the reason why I've commissioned this work from Professor Adrian Davis and uh, the Scottish Institute for Policing Research to really help the police to, to sort of drill down into this data and to consider how they would uh, react to a, a national default and where they may, may choose to prioritise their, um, their resources. And I think it, you know, it's welcome that um, they've acknowledged that there would be a need for strong police involvement in the initial six months. Um, but there is a question there that, that needs um, further discussion with the police around you know, built up areas uh, and this level of seriously injured people and whether, whether we have the, the balance right. Peter, you wanted to, to follow up. One final thing. I mean, as I said, very often the, the, the traffic is travelling at around 20 miles an hour, not because it's a limit, but because the traffic conditions are such, that the amount of traffic is such, that it, it's physically impossible to go any further, faster than that at peak times. I'm just going to focus in on when we're, uh, we're out with peak times, when traffic levels are a lot lower, the temptation will be for many drivers to drive above the 20 mile an hour limit because the, at that point in, in the day they can. And I accept that there's a duty on the police to enforce 20 miles an hour, but I also accept what we heard that there's no, there is no more resource to do that. So the end result is going to be that many more drivers are going to be breaking the law. End of story. That, and I just ask you to accept that that is a reality. Um, I I mean, I maybe asked um, perhaps Andrew Milne just to, to talk about um, where we think the, you know, there may be an increase in terms of um, you know, fines um, uh, and, and that side of things. Um, I mean, I think the evidence is quite clear from Atkins and other studies that 20 mile an hour doesn't undermine other speed limits. In fact, speeds reduce on surrounding 40 and 60 mile an hour roads. Overall, it's reducing speed. Will there be variants throughout the day? Well, yes, but I mean, I think you've also heard evidence from Police Scotland that they're not saying to people, well, it's okay, it's three in the morning, speed up, you can, you know, rumble down Royal Mile at 40 if you want. There are implications at every time of the day if people speed, and part of this is about education. If you are driving fast through the centre of Edinburgh at 3 a.m. in the morning, there may be fewer uh, pedestrians on the road and less traffic, but you know, there may be people who are particularly vulnerable as well, who could step out in front of your, your taxi or your vehicle. So, you know, the, the, the message here and the understanding of the impact of, of, uh, of speeding uh, is, a, is a process of engaging drivers in that and understanding not just the implications if you get caught, um, but also the implications if you are in an accident. It could be extremely serious for your career um, and for the wider community and, and all of the individuals involved, not just the person who's in the accident, but the driver as well. Um, maybe yeah. just very I really, just briefly, but um, um, yes. Mr Milne could just explain about fine income. Do, do look to your left as well, because you, you may find your researcher might want, want to add something to what you're saying. Yes, so, uh, Andrew, yes, um, head on. Thank you. Um, well, certainly when we were doing the financial memorandum, we did 
take into account levels of compliance with speed limits. And we've got a table, table one, on page four, which gives current statistics for levels of compliance with different speed limits. And it backs up, I think, what Mark was saying just a, a few minutes ago about that there will be there might be some uh, greater level of non-compliance on 20 mile an hour, but it's not as great as um, you might otherwise think. And we use that as a basis for then working out what uh, additional costs might arise uh, if there was a need for greater number of prosecutions and penalties and so forth. And all of that is very carefully costed. Um, but we also say, of course, um, that although that is based on a certain number of assumptions and it comes up with certain numbers, if the bill is successfully implemented with uh, an effective public information campaign that uh, succeeds in changing the culture, as is the intention behind it, then, of course, levels of compliance may not go up at all. So there is a possibility of some of these costs being avoided, but we have costed quite carefully on the basis of uh, some increase in speeding. Okay. Which needs, I think, leads neatly on uh, to you, Jamie. Thank you, convener. Uh, we, we do spend a lot of time in this. I think the member probably shares a lot of the frustration around the narrative of this as we focus on numbers and percentages and and the costs, and I, I would like to talk about the costs, and because they are important. Um, but before I do so, um, uh, you know, I just want to share a short anecdote. I usually I promote active travel. Uh, the member will be aware, um, but I did choose to drive to work this morning um, from my uh, home in Edinburgh, and at 20 miles per hour or less the entire journey. Of course, as I always do. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> But that experience, I think it's important we do put this in the context of what motorists experience out there, because in the real world, this is about what happens out there uh, amongst driver behaviour and amongst pedestrian cyclists' perceptions of the safety of the road. And I think this is, really gets to the crux of this bill. Um, throughout that journey, I had two cars overtake me because I was, in their eyes I was driving too slow. One pulled out in front of a bus. Um, another cyclist overtook me um, because they felt I was going too slow on a downward hill. And another driver sat so far close to the, my rear bumper, I could see the whites of his eyes. So do, do you understand people's genuine concerns over this idea that not everyone will drive at 20 miles per hour? And when you try and do so, it, it can be incredibly difficult. So I think the Edinburgh experience is interesting. I think you know we've all got our own experiences of, of driving in Edinburgh and cycling in Edinburgh and walking in Edinburgh. I think I would point to the evidence that was presented to the committee by Ruth Jepson, who's doing the largest study anywhere in the UK into 20 mile an hour rollout, which shows that public objection to 20 in Edinburgh has gone down over the last year. Now, I don't deny that there are those that may be frustrated driving at 20 mile an hour. I think there is a question around the appropriate selection and retention of 30 mile an hour limits on arterial roads. Um, there are certainly roads where I think it's important to retain 30 miles an hour because those are the roads that are arterial in nature and are needed. Uh, we need that higher speed limit for traffic flow. And if they're largely non-residential, then there may be a case for those roads to be 30 miles an hour. But that's a local decision for councils to make. And there will be discussion around whether councils have made the right decision. I know there's that discussion in Edinburgh about whether all the roads need to be 20 or whether some could be 30 or whatever. But, but the, there needs to be a judgment there around what the function of that road is. Is it largely residential? Um, does it have an arterial function? And therefore, is it appropriate for it to be 20 or should it be retained as 30? But let's be clear, these are the minority of roads. I mean, I, I don't show sure about your journey this morning, but if you were driving through a, a residential housing estate in a suburb of Edinburgh, I presume that perhaps people weren't tailgating you there. They were perhaps more concerned if you're on an arterial road. So in terms of relieving driver frustration, it is about choosing the appropriate roads to retain us at 30. And I think, you know, it would again point to the evidence you've had for Road Haulage Association. Road Haulage Association um, doesn't object to this bill. Um, you know, the, the HGV drivers, the professional drivers, don't object to this bill. What they want to see is an appropriate retention of a 30 arterial network. And I absolutely share their view. I, I agree with the Road Lords Association on that point. We need to retain roads as 30. But let's be clear, those are minority of roads within an urban environment. Okay, that, that's very helpful. Thank you for that response. Um, so moving on to the, the cost then yeah. um, issue that's come up time after time throughout evidence sessions and uh, this morning. 
Um, what is your understanding of the total potential cost of the implementation of this bill? And that's relevant to either central government costs or local authorities, um, probably excluding any costs associated with police enforcement. Okay, so the, the um, financial uh, memorandum that we've worked on um, with uh, Mr Milne and, and my colleague uh, Malachy um, in conjunction with Scots, who of course represent those who will actually be implementing the bill, um, estimate a figure of uh, between 21 and uh, 22 uh, million pounds um, over, over two, sorry, sorry the local authority costs um, over, over two years. And, you know, this modelling, as I indicated earlier in the session, was based on um, a model of, uh, based on figures provided by Angus Council uh, and Edinburgh Council as to their existing 20 mile an hour rollouts. I might, um, I might ask uh, Mr Milne perhaps to expand if that would be useful on how that financial modelling has been, has been arrived at. Sorry, I, I mean, we could, we could spend a lot of time getting into the... Um the sort of algorithms behind it, but just just the top line figures. You, you've said 21 to 22 million pounds. Is that just local authorities, or does that include Crown Office, Scottish Government, courts? Um, so that, if, I'm just looking at the table yeah. I have in the mm -hmm. briefing paper. It says that the annual cost in the first two years equates to 10.2 to 11.9 mm -hmm. in our briefing. So I'm just trying to correlate yep. those numbers. How does yep. that how does that match with your 21? Sorry. Yes, I mean, that, that, that is in, in the, the financial um, memorandum. Again, I can't see the table you've got in front of me, but um, I believe that that's probably from the financial memorandum. There should be a table and it outlines costs for Scottish Government, Crown Office, Prosecution Service, Local Authorities, Police Scotland, etc. So if that's what you're looking at, uh, that, that's what I'm looking at in, in front of me. So, so, yeah, just want to clarify. Yeah. Just can we can we clarify that? I, I'm, I'm slightly confused, Mark, in the sense that you're creating a figure of 21 million, and the table in the bill is is saying in the first two years is 10.2 to 11.9 million. Sorry, could you just clarify which one is it, or a vote? Annual costs. Annual costs. Ah, okay. Over over two years. <laughs> okay, I've got that. Thank you for explaining yeah. that to me. The, uh, the, uh, the comments we received from Scots, who I believe were uh, who participated in, in the cost things, uh, the author of uh, some of the projections said that uh, they thought that 19 million was at the low end and 33 million was at the upper end. Um, can we take, for example, the experience of Edinburgh? Um, my, uh, we did some, some FOIs with uh, the City of Edinburgh Council. And it came back uh, that the cost of the 20 mile per hour project to Edinburgh Council was nearly three million pounds, 2.96. Um, so I'm just trying to put that into context. That's just one local authority. Uh, how do you then compare the experience of Edinburgh's substantial costs and doing it in one local authority versus a national rollout of just 22 million? But that's because Edinburgh was doing it under the current system. Right. And I think, as you heard in evidence, um, that they said it was uh, at least double the, 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 the cost. Um, that's on the official report. So that is the cost of doing it under the current system, is a lot higher. I mean, what, what we've... Maybe I might ask Aunt Mr Milne mm -hmm. to explain a bit further. I mean, we've tried to explain in the financial memorandum as carefully as we can what the methodology is. And some of the calculations are not straightforward. We have data, as Mr Russell has said, from some particular authorities like Angus and, and Edinburgh, and we've tried to extrapolate from those to a national level. That, that is not an easy exercise because you can't just multiply by 32, which is the number of local authorities, from the basis of one, because that particular local authority you're starting from won't be representative, either because of its geography or the proportion of, rural, of roads in built-up areas. Edinburgh, obviously, will have a very high proportion of its roads are in built-up areas compared with other councils, for example, but also because some of those figures, are, as, as Mr Roscoe has also said, are derived from the actual cost of implementing widespread 20s under the current regime, which is a relatively cumbersome and, and, and costly process. So with the bill, uh, many authorities who have not yet taken significant steps towards widespread 20s would be going through a different process post the bill, and the cost would therefore be different. So the extrapolation is complex. Uh, all, what, all I can say is that we have tried in the FM to explain as carefully as we can, as openly and transparently as we can, the methodology that we have used. 
as with any FM, it is a, a matter of informed guesswork. It is not a scientific process, and we can't claim that the numbers at the end of the document are the last word. There will be different ways of arriving at numbers, and different people in good faith will arrive at slightly different numbers. Um, but where we've made assumptions, we've explained what those are, and where there are gaps where we can't, simply can't attach numbers to particular elements, we've said that too. So on that basis, I do stand by the figures that we've produced as, as a good, honest estimate of the realistic cost of this. Um, as I say, other people may arrive at different figures, but what's, yeah. I think, quite striking is that the experts themselves, Scots, have come up with broadly yeah. comparable figures. I, I should say briefly that this is based on the current regulations for signage. So this is assuming that on a 30 retained road, you may need repeaters. So we're costing eight million pounds for repeaters. If signage guidance changed, may not be required. We've assumed that um, existing 20 mile an hour repeaters will need to be removed because they're no longer an exception anymore. They're default, therefore you don't need repeater signs. So if, if, if government would come to us and say, well, actually, you know, we can, we can, this is how we'd like to change TSRGD, um, it, it, potentially these costs could be substantially reduced, but we've not based it on that. We've based it on, if you like, the, the worst case scenario at, at, at this point. And as I mentioned earlier, we based it on a rural model where you would assume a greater proportion of exit and entry signs because communities are smaller. Um, so we, we've you know, been, I think, quite accurate in terms of our costing. And I spoke to Scots last night and again, and they are, you know, they're, they're content that what we have at this point is, is robust. So the other thing that Scots say in their letter submitted yesterday is that adequate funding should, provided, should be provided to local authorities to do this. So, I mean, the big question is, where is this money coming from? Because there's nothing in the French memorandum that states that the government, central government, will give local authorities any additional funding to implement the change. So you, whether you agree with the final numbers in the FM or not is, is a, a matter for, for debate. But there, there will inevitably be a cost of at least £20 million. Pounds. And my understanding is that the brunt of that will be, will be borne by local authorities. It's fair to say we have had representation from local authorities who are concerned about those costs. So where, where do you think that money should come from? Who should pay for the implementation of what is in effect a central government policy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a, a change in a national default limit for restricted roads. So I, I, I do believe that, that national government should be paying for the bulk of these costs. I mean. There are local authorities, of course, have tried to do this under existing budgets over many, many years. Clap Manager, for example, used their road safety budget, uh, tried to ration it out to introduce 20 exemption after exemption. Um, other councils have, have done the same. Um, but I think if this is a national rollout, that there clearly would be a role for the Scottish Government in this. I think if you look at procurement of signage, for example, there could be opportunities there for arm's length companies that local authorities run, like to take side contracts to be engaged in sign manufacture. But I mean, certainly the discussion we've had with Scots that you know they're, they're seeing that an element of national procurement would be most cost effective way to, to deliver this. Um, just before we leave the, the issue of cost, we heard from the cabinet secretary that the marketing figure that had been put in there may be <clears throat> very low um, and suggested that if, if this was to be rolled out, it, it would have to be a substantially higher figure. Do you have a comment on that? So the, the, the figure that we have in the financial memorandum is based on uh, the cost of a, of a typical national campaign. The, the Scottish Government already have a budget for these national campaigns. We've assumed uh, an uplift of that of around half a million. Um, to provide a particular focus on, on 20 mile an hour and national education. Um, but, I mean, it would be the choice of government about whether they wish to, to go further, um, particularly if they wish to introduce a, a multi-annual campaign that could last for longer than two years. They currently have an existing budget for that. Um, is there a case to go beyond that? Um, I think it would, it would obviously be based on reflection about what the... Uh, benefit had been over the first year of, of funding of a national campaign like that, and whether it needed to be substantially increased over time. But just to go back to the bill, the bill is predicated on a modest reduction of average speed, which is currently done by local authorities that don't have hardly any budget to do this kind of work. Clap Manager did no educational uh, work with the police, very little when it introduced 20. Um, so anything that, that the government would do beyond that, you could rightly assumed that would help to drive that culture change even further, but that would be a choice for the government. 
misquote him, but I think he suggested that national marketing campaigns would cost significantly more than that. He would have better experience than me. Uh, Mike, you, and then I'm going to go to the last question, which is Richard Lyle. Th thank you, Convener. I just want to pick up what Mark has just said. He's just said that he thought that because this is a national issue, uh, a national initiative, this bill, it's up to the, it should be the national government, the Scottish government, to foot the bill and not our local authorities. That's what you've just said. Well, why did you, why did you put in the financial memorandum up to £20 million for local authorities and only 450000 for the Scottish government? That doesn't bear in mind what you've just said. Well, because local authorities would have to pay in the first instance. But as we know through government investment in road safety and active travel, um, you know, bud budget lines can you know, appear in the Scottish Government to support local authorities to do work that national government feels important. And there's a partnership there with local authorities. Now, most councils... Did, are, sorry. did you not think it was important when you're presenting a member's bill to be absolutely clear where you think you're, you're the member in charge of this bill mm. and you've just said in verbal evidence to us just now that you feel that this should be funded on a national basis and yet the evidence you presented to us in written form in the financial memorandum, you've said the opposite. You've said that £20 million should come from local authorities and only 450000 from, uh, from the government. What, what the Why is that? What the financial memorandum says is that local authorities would need to spend that money uh, in order to bring about uh, a national default 20 mile an hour. That is correct. Where do local authorities get their money from? Uh, council tax, Scottish Government, uh, core grants, etc. So there is a, I'm not going to deny, there is, a, there is a question there. There are huge savings from this huge savings, some of which come back to local authorities. There is an upfront cost, yeah, there is an upfront cost in this. Um, local authorities would, would bear um, that cost, but how that's funded is a, is, a, is, is a question also for the Scottish Government. Fine. So the last question then is from Richard Lyle. So uh, hopefully a brief question and a brief answer. Yeah, so, uh, well, to, to round up, when drink driving came in, people said it wouldn't work. When the no smoking ban came in, people said it wouldn't work. So, in regard to your bill, can you set out what you consider is like the likely benefit of the proposals of the bill and how this compares to other interventions that I've just mentioned? Yeah, I, I think it's it's very similar. I mean, this is a this is a public health intervention. I think you've heard that evidence from. Professor Adrian, Adrian Davis, um, who, who's an expert in public health. You've heard that from Dr. Ruth Jepson as well. This is a very cost-effective public health intervention. If, if you're looking at what the, the ratio is for cost to benefits, um, you know, yes, it, you know, 20, 20 million pounds um, to, to, to put the signs up to get this in place. But, you know, potentially 35 million pounds of savings year on year on year. Uh, tremendous cost to anyone. Well, it was funny because that was a point that um, that my son raised um, the other week. Um, oh dear. Yeah. How, how would I? How would I feel if I knocked down a, a toddler? How would I? How would people feel if their their, their loved one was killed? Mm. And 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 if this helps to save one life, it's worth all the millions of pounds, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It, it was a point, because my son said to me, um, how are you getting on with the 21 hour bill? And I said, I've got a big committee session this week. And I said, there's obviously going to be a lot of debate about costs. And he said the words, um, you can't spend money to bring back somebody from the dead. So, and, you know, that's right. I at. wish you real, Mark. Thanks. That's probably a very good point to leave it. And I'd like to thank you, Mark, for the evidence that you've given this morning. It, it's clearly you, you've presented uh, your case, and thank you for that. I'd like to thank Maliki for coming in and uh, I think you had a chance to come in, and Andrew, you had a few chances, and Claudia, you had a chance uh, to come in. So thank you very much for, for giving evidence uh, this morning. Uh, I'd like to now briefly suspend the meeting uh, for five minutes, and we'll then move into closed session. So thank you very much. <laughs>